Good morning. Welcome to our panel discussion today, uh, addressing licensing and the Internet of Things, hosted by the Forum for Intellectual Property at the Hudson Institute. I'll be the moderator of our panel discussion today. My name is Adam Mossoff. I am chair of the Forum for Intellectual Property and a senior scholar at the Hudson Institute, as well as a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. We have a fantastic a group of panelists uh, with a varied background and experiences to talk about patent licensing um, and the deployment of patented innovation into the innovation economy and the next generation of the innovation economy that will arise very shortly, or we are on the cusp of the revolution with the Internet of Things. <clears throat> In order of their initial remarks, we will first be hearing from Bo Hyden who is director of the Center for Intellectual Property and executive director of the Tusher Center for the Management of Intellectual Capital at UC Berkeley. Then we will have Richard Vary, who is a partner at Bird and & Bird. And last, but certainly not least, we will have Monica Magnussen, who is vice president of intellectual property rights policy at Ericsson. There are many accolades and achievements and, and prior professional accomplishments by all of our panelists, but you would prefer to hear them speak today rather than me listing these. So feel free to Google them um, after the panel today if you wish to know more about our speakers. So as I mentioned, we we're gonna be talking today about licensing and the licensing particularly of patent innovation in the, in the internet of things. Connected devices today are all, have already changed our lives tremendously, uh, beginning with the mobile revolution with our smartphones and tablets, and now proceeding into all areas of our lives, <clears throat> including now connected cars, and soon what we are referring to as the Internet of Things. This will enable the development of smart transportation. It's going to transform healthcare. It's going to create better enterprise solutions. It's going to innovate agriculture and food production, and so much more. According to a recent report, the Internet of Things market reached $389 billion in 2020, and it's forecast to rise to more than a trillion dollars in 2030, just seven years from now. Despite these incredible benefits that we've already experienced and that we are seeing just on the horizon, some commentators and scholars believe that the licensing of patented technologies in this area um, that has been enabling this revolution will become an impediment to the expansion of the high-tech sector and the global innovation economy more generally. In some countries, such as the European Union, policymakers are even questioning whether there is a need to directly regulate the licensing of technologies that will underpin the Internet of, uh, Internet of Things um, in the years to come. Um, as an initial matter, our, our panelists will speak for a few moments uh, about their general view of the state of patent licensing and the cusp of the revolution and Internet of Things that we are on. And then I'll be ad uh, addressing some more specific questions to each of them over the span of the next hour. So first, we'll begin with Bo. Bo, what's your view of the, the, uh, of the state of the world with respect to patent licensing and the Internet of Things? All right. So thanks, Adam. Um, I think you set it up there rather good. And and just to reiterate a little bit so we can start on what everyone I think can agree on and where maybe we disagree, because I think that's what we want to get to, is that you mentioned that the Internet of Things is, is considered to be very important development um, for the economy and for society, right? So we can I think we all agree on that. And certainly, this is not a problem that policymakers should be concerned about the development of IoT in their countries and regions. Th this is reasonable. The question then for policymakers is what role should they play in facilitating the development of IoT? And, and answering this question, it depends on what is perceived to be the problem, if there is one, and whether regulation will, will improve the situation. This is the type of question that we would think about to frame this. Um, so for me, I see that the idea that SCPs and SCP licensing are impediments, as you mentioned, for IoT is typically based on a couple what I would say uh, misconceptions or misconceived starting points. One of those is that uh, uh, SCPs 
were an impediment in the previous mobile sector. So it all you usually get into conversations that, well, things were, were bad. We had these smartphone wars and we need to stop that from happening in IoT. And while there was contention in mobile phone um, industry from an economist's perspective, we, we have more mobile phone subscriptions in the world than we have human beings. So certainly we did something very successful. Even the poorest people in the world have access to mobile telephony. So, um, so while there were costs and things that could be improved. The starting point is not such a negative position as we normally, as some people present it to be, is actually quite successful and quite remarkable. And then we should think about what we can do to improve on it. The second one is that sometimes there's a discussion that SCPs aren't critical to the creation of high performance open standards in the first place. You know, people treat it as some extra side thing that, well, we have to deal with these SCPs in the licensing, but really it's part it's core to the whole system of why these high performance standards can be created in the first place. And we need to look at this completely holistically and we leave that out of the equation oftentimes. So open standards such as cellular, for example, are built on numerous collective market mechanisms. You have this standard development organizations, you have the FRAN commitments, you have patent pools and platforms, you have all this collective market activity already. So for me, with this environment where people are working together collectively to begin with, it would be better for policymakers to provide better information for the market, not so, not regulation. So information, not regulation, especially in this new nascent IoT markets. So that's that's for me in the beginning. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Richard. Richard. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. So every time um, something changes and industries converge. Um, we see uh, we see terrific changes. We see um, the two industries having to come together, and they have to find ways to work together. There is, um, a, a, I think, a bit of a misconception at the moment. We think that the Internet of Things is this step change, um, and that what we are doing all of a sudden is um, combining a mobile phone industry, which is existing and static, with a whole new industry of connected devices that we don't yet conceive of, cars being the first one, but other things. The reality is that this has been this evolution has been going on for some considerable time. If we go back to me in the 1990s, I had my mobile phone, I had my camera, I had my personal desktop assistant, I didn't have a digital music player, those didn't exist yet. Um, I had my credit card, I had my rail ticket, all of these things that have gradually and slowly become into the smartphone device. So the first thing that happened is back in the early sort of 2000s, um, your camera became your phone became your camera. Um, and you start to see the convergence of the industries, the classic, the Nokia, the Ericsson, the Motorola's, um, all of a sudden are joined in the industry by the conventional camera players or um, uh, domestic electronic uh, manufacturers, Samsung and LG come into the scene. And you see the first clash then of cultures of um, one industry, the mobile phone industry that has developed its licensing model and is being joined by new companies that have come from a completely different licensing background. And that's the start of what it was, the smartphone wars. The PDA became part of it. Palm, your Palm Pilot became into your mobile phone. Again, you see another new entrant into there. Your BlackBerry and your mobile phone effectively become combined into one. You remember when we all had those two devices? So you have to get on again with the licensing of those two industries. A really big change came when our music players became our mobile phones. That's Apple arriving in the marketplace. Um, and all of a sudden, Apple had a very different way of doing business, and it wanted to impose its views on the industries. Um, my DVD player has become my phone. Today, I don't carry a credit card or a rail ticket anymore. All of those have become in my phone. And somehow, all of this has happened. And yet, we think the Internet of Things is something still to come. It's not. It's here now, and it's in our phones today. But what we've witnessed throughout all of this is a gradual evolution of licensing practice as new entrants come into the industry and have to fit in with the licensing practicing models that are in, in there um, and to some extent change them. But so far, the industry has coped and it's coped incredibly successfully. Now, the, with, with cars becoming connected, we did see a big change. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, and uh, what that might do to the licensing model. Um, but what I, I want to make everyone think is just step back a little, a little and look at where we've come, what our mobile phone has evolved into, how much technology has become part of this, this device that we now call a smartphone, um, and how we have coped with that change so far along, and how I think we're going to carry on coping with it. 
I don't think this this change is quite as big and as scary as everybody says it's going to be. Well, that was uh, a, a fantastic and incredibly succinct uh, history of the uh, of the world, uh, Richard. Um, in fact, it almost made me tempted to want to go grab my uh, Palm Pilot that I still actually have in, in a drawer in one of my desks. Alongside <laughs> your digital camera, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, and uh, Monica, uh, your your thoughts on kind of where we are in the current state of the of uh, technology and the Internet of Things. So good morning, everyone. And uh, trying to be a little short and swift here in the introduction. Uh, I'd just like to get give you a perspective from way up north, where for many, many years, we've been talking about how anything that benefits from being connected will eventually be connected. And just like Richard pointed to, it's been a gradual development. It's been going on for years, and it's still going on. And it's clear to me that connectivity can bring enormous value to many things. Sometimes it doesn't sound so dramatic, but it really is like remotely controlling your heater of your car. That's what I used my first connect connection in my first connected car for. Um, and at that point, people in my country gladly paid 900 euros to get a GPRS, a 2G data module into their cars as an extra cost. That's how much we all valued it. And since then, I've actually driven four consecutive cars on three-year leases where all of them have been connected. So that's over a period of 12 years. All of them have been connected. And as far as I know, none of those were licensed. Now, even the Advocate General in the European Court of Justice case, Huawei versus Adi, acknowledged that getting all the licenses in place before you start selling isn't necessarily doable or even reasonable, given the amount of licenses needed to be concluded. But it strikes me as a little odd that if it takes 12 years to get there, that you're arguing over accessibility of technology <clears throat> or deployment of technology as the problem. Maybe we should also look at the other end of the equation, the return on investment end. And I think it's important to remember that it's only because some large players spend huge amounts investing early and risky in R&D to develop these standards that we even have this conversation because it's because of those early investments, heavy investments by large players, that small enterprise even can enter this market in the first place. So I would challenge anyone to come up with any technology as sophisticated that has been deployed so broadly and so quickly as cellular connectivity. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, this is a, some great introductory remarks where I think we've got a good framework. Um, both Monica and uh, Richard uh, um, uh, discussed and addressed kind of historical aspects, but also uh, kind of current continuing development of connectivity with our cars. Um, and the automobile sector seems to be the kind of the current place where the um, where the Internet of Things is being deployed kind of most quickly and is getting and is getting developed uh, uh, at, at the fastest pace at the moment. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, as we have seen in, in, with leaps forward in technology throughout all of history, as Richard has described, and going even further back, uh, development of electrical systems and sewing machines, as I'm known for, uh, you know, we've seen some legal disputes arising with the uh, automobile industry um, and the licensing of these uh, standard essential patents, these patented technologies on standards um, that enable this connectivity. Um, now the the courts are uh, have been addressing these issues and the disputes are 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 starting to be resolved. Um, but perhaps uh, Rich, uh, Richard, you can give us kind of a, a quick overview as well, another kind of minute, uh, quick uh, history uh, um, of kind of what were these disputes about and what did courts around the globe say about uh, say about them as they as they address them? Yeah, of course. Um, so the uh, the dispute I was most intimately involved in is the Daimler and Nokia one that took place in Germany, um, and the corresponding complaints that were made to the CJ uh, sorry to the um, European Commission 
um, by the various tier one suppliers and by Daimler's supplier as well. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Daimler is the manufacturer of Mercedes cars. Um, and so very popular in Germany, very popular in the UK, um, uh, where, where you, will, you will see them. They have been had connectivity since about 2008, uh, was when is the, the first of the Mercedes cars that had cellular connectivity um, built into it. Um, and while Monica talked about a use in, um, in Sweden of um, being able to turn on your heater in your car before you get onto it, which is extremely useful. Probably the greatest use of connectivity in the UK with our incredibly crowded roads and massive traffic problems is the, the ability for the car to have live traffic updates um, and to continually reroute you around the, the various traffic jams and uh, problems that we have on our roads. So connected cars in the UK are incredibly popular and incredibly useful as well. Same is true in Germany. Um, what happened uh, in the history of the, that was that Nokia approached the various automotive manufacturers and said, um, well, come on, chaps, it's probably time you started taking a license to all of our technology that you're now using. Um, and it, this happened, this, this started to happen four or five years ago, at about the time when Mercedes was making a very big play um, about their, their cars. They described the, the new Mercedes A-Class as a smartphone on wheels. So this was the the, the selling point of, of the device. It's no longer about the 2.8 litre V6 engine under the hood or the 400 horsepower. It's about the connectivity and it's about your download speed, not your acceleration speed. So this is the sort of the, the, the change that has happened in the automotive sector. Um, and the automotives, uh, the, the big OEM automotive manufacturers um, said to their suppliers of connectivity technology, um, chaps, you need to sort this problem out for us. Um, you, you supply us the technology, you need to um, deal with the licensing situation. Um, and uh, the connectivity uh, suppliers had a difficulty. Um, and you can see that the, the way the, the industry works is you start with your, uh, the core of it is the OEM, the vehicle manufacturer. And he is the guy in the automotive industry that has the buying power. He controls his supply chain very carefully um, and the success of the automotive suppliers de depends very much on their ability to maintain and control the costs in their supply chain. So they buy connectivity solutions from their tier one providers who make a thing called a telematics control unit, which when it's combined with the aerial, the header unit, various other features that then go into the car, provides the connectivity technology within the car. The suppliers of those telematics control units are typically the people like Vallejo, um, uh, continental they in turn buy uh, modules from module suppliers such as telet or sierra wireless or huawei um, which contain um, baseband uh, processors and um, rf chips from suppliers such as qualcomm so further down the chain and the problem is that the uh, the problem arose from the control the price control that the oems um, imposed on that supply chain so you may be able to buy a chipset from qualcomm for 15 20 euros that might go into a module which sells for 30, 40 euros, which goes into a telematics control unit, um, which sells for perhaps 95 euros um, to, the, to the OEM vehicle uh, uh, manufacturer. Um, but the, the profit margin on that telematics control unit is perhaps only four or five euros. At the same time, the OEMs are asking those tier ones now to pick up the licensing cost. And the licensing cost is rather more than the profit margin that they've got available. They're being asked by the SCP owners to pay, you know, maybe a few euros each. But by the time you add all of this up, it's starting to get towards 20 euros per telematics control unit. And they just don't have the headroom in their profit margin. So you can start to see how the dispute arises. Daimler says to Nokia, I'm not paying you. You have to deal with my tier one supplier. The tier one supplier says, I can't pay you. I just don't have the profit margin available. And if I pay you and I pay everybody the, the, the royalties that you're asking and the royalties that you're getting in the smartphone sector, I just can't make a profit. So they're stuck. They're stuck in this, in this, this logjam. Nokia sued Daimler. Um, it established in several cases that it had valid and infringed standard essential patents. I don't think anyone's particularly surprised by that um, decision. Um, and uh, Daimler, uh, Daimler's defense was, um, you haven't offered me a a license on Fran's terms, um, and more to the point, you should be you should be offering a license to my tier one suppliers. I should be able to choose who in the supply chain takes a license, and they're the ones who want to take a license. Um, and the tier one suppliers intervened and said, 
you haven't offered us a fair license because it's not a license that we can afford based on our profit margin. The German courts generally dismissed these, um, these defences. Um, they, uh, they found that Daimler hadn't made any offers to take a license on fair terms, and they granted injunctions against Daimler from continuing to, to sell connected vehicles. Um, until one court, the Dusseldorf court, said, this is actually raising an interesting question, and it's a question that we're going to refer to the CJEU. Um, there are, there's a number of courts in Germany, so by this time there were already injunctions in Mannheim and in Munich, but the, um, the Dusseldorf court tried to refer the question to the CJEU, and it said um, to the CJEU, here's a question. If you've got someone who's down the supply chain um, and wants to take a license, and you have somebody at the end of the supply chain who is being sued, is it a defence for him to say that the, uh, a fair and reasonable offer should be made to the tier one supplier? We never got to a CJU decision on this point because, in the meantime, Daimler took a license from Avanci. Avanci is a patent pool of many of the uh, SEP owners in the automotive uh, that offers licenses to the automotive sector, and it included Nokia's patents. So Daimler took the Avanci license, and that then brought the whole um, litigation to an end. But that that question had been raised. So at the same time, there were complaints to the European Commission about all of this. And again, exactly the same point was being raised to the European Commission. Does Nokia have to license people further down the supply chain or can it offer licenses only to the, uh, to the, um, the OEMs? Again, we never got to, to the bottom of that. I should say in Nokia's defense that there, this, this is a vast oversimplification and Nokia had actually offered um, arrangements that the tier ones could sign up to, and it had offered uh, arrangements that the OEMs could uh, um, uh, uh, sign up to as well. So, so it had done to some extent what the the tier ones were asking for. Um, but the, 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 there were there were greater details and greater reasons why the tier ones said that this this didn't work. But we never we never got to the answer on that. So that's where the situation was left in Europe. Um, now others have signed up to these Avanci licenses, and now all of the major European vehicle manufacturers are signed up for um, to at least for 4G. 5G is where the next argument is going to be. So we're going to see what happens there. Continuing the uh, the thesis that you began with that all things old are new again. Uh, <laughs> is, you know, as you're describing the, uh, the conflicts within the automotive industry, it sounds very similar to the prior conflicts in the mobile phone industry where the yeah. dispute was over whether you have to license at the chip level or the or the device level of the mobile phone. Yeah. And so we're just seeing a repeat of it in the automotive industry. It's interesting you mentioned Avanci too. Um, from what I understand now, Avanci has now uh, obtained uh, licenses with 80% of the automobile manufacturers in the, uh, in the automotive sector um, uh, with respect to the mobile telecommunications uh, technologies that are covered by the patents of the various patent owners who are members of the Avanci patent pool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, and, um, the Chinese manufacturers. Sorry, Basically, everyone except the Chinese manufacturers, but it's only up to 4G so far, the 5G mm -hmm. is yeah. Yeah, and and uh, and and you know, Vanchi has 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 proven to be very successful in facilitating the the, the licensing of these technologies, um, and uh, and yet there continue to be arguments um, that one hears in court cases in the United States and elsewhere that um, that again that these licenses and the, and the practices by the patent owners, the SCP owners, in asking for licenses um, are unnecessarily restricting the ability of of companies to deploy their products and to innovate themselves. Um, and you see this in particularly now being expressed in the context of, well, what about small businesses and small, medium and enterprises, the SMEs, um, especially as they seem to be very important with respect to um, the evolving IoT sector. Bo, uh, what is your view on, on, on this um, uh, kind of as this development that has been described so, so nicely by Richard and as we're seeing it now being the arguments being deployed with respect to kind of small businesses and individuals and startups in the IoT space? Sure, I think this is a good question um, to discuss a bit more. And again, I'll try to frame it a bit on what hopefully we can agree upon and where things may seem to be problematic, but are they really and where should we look to find these answers? So if we start out, I think everyone can agree that it's very, and everyone's very positive towards the development of small businesses and IoT. I don't think that anyone um, is negative towards that. And I think that uh, yeah. everyone believes that small technology firms are 
you know, the engine of innovation. And, and, and of course that should be facilitated as much as possible. So we all agree there, right? Now the question again is, um, do, does SCP licensing impact the growth of these technology SMEs? This is the question, right? And so first um, to discuss this, the first point I would like to make is that it's important to understand that successful technology businesses don't stay small for very long. Oh. Right? They either grow or they die. So, so their smallness is transitory. And if you take a company like in Sweden, like uh, Spotify, I think it was an SME for about 15 seconds when it launched. And then it grew to be bigger than what is the level for SMEs. So, so technology companies, if they're successful, we're not going to be small. There are no long lasting, small, successful tech companies. So this is not going to last for very long. Second, um, I haven't seen any evidence um, that uh, the implementation of FRAN-based standards has ever been slowed down. The deployment has been slowed down um, of, for connectivity products. So as Monica mentioned, it didn't stop uh, the car companies from producing cars with, with, uh, with connectivity just because it wasn't licensed. Um, so there has been problems getting people to license, but I've never seen anybody say, well, I'm not gonna produce a product because I'm not sure if I can get all the licenses. That typically for me hasn't happened. So, so, the, so the idea that small companies would not do something because of this doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence historically on that. Third, um, typically SCP holders um, don't necessarily seek licenses from small actors. There's a huge long tail of very small um, mobile phone manufacturers as well. And, and most companies don't take the time to go after every single company that produces small volume. So small companies, and in this case, in this transitory phase before they become bigger, it's not really worth it to go after these companies in, uh, in the first place. So to some extent, you could argue they're a bit indemnified until they get a bit bigger. Um, and, uh, and fourth, if, a, if an IoT vertical were to contain just a very large number of tech SME implementers, it may not be the best practice to license in the value chain um, at that level without some type of collective solution. So it's not obvious that the SMEs in IoT will be at the level of licensing. There are no SMEs that have been implicated in automotive, for example. This is not, so, so the idea that automotive taught us that we should worry about the SMEs, there really has been no SME issue in automotive. So while it's certainly clear that um, IoT implementers in the future, that as they grow, are going to want to know how much should they pay in royalties, and is everyone else going to pay as well? That, you know, that's reasonable. It's not obvious that small companies in this growth trajectory are going to be impacted in a negative way that requires some type of special regulation. Oh, you're saying that Mercedes is not an SME? <laughs> not, not, not anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a really nice overview of the history and the and the, and the models and the and the theory. Um, so, uh, Monica, on the ground, uh, from your perspective at a, at a company, uh, do you see how do you see ways in which licensing is an impediment to small businesses in the IoT industry? And what are what are what are companies like yours uh, doing uh, to help small businesses grow in this space? Well, I would first stress that licensing is what makes these proprietary technologies available at all, because we're talking about deploying products built on technology developed by somebody else. And licensing is the means for allowing for that. It mm -hmm. can make the technology avail available to small enterprises and large, and at the same time, ensure a return on investment for those companies who actually did major investments upfront very early um, to develop these technologies. And in 3GPP, where cellular communication is developed, we have been developing these technologies with this specific issue in mind that the whole point was to allow for anything that benefited from being connected to actually be connected. Um, and um, it would make no sense to try and stop it once it's starting to, to be deployed. For a start, my company makes networks. The more traffic, the better for a network provider. Why would I try to block the deployment of the technology that I have developed for the exact course of it being brought and deployed? Um, but I think that the important thing that Richard also pointed to is that there are different traditions in different industries. And obviously, even though we could technically 
predict, I think pretty well, together with other 3GPP partners, what technically could be beneficial for various products and various industries. It's a whole different ballgame to understand how the businesses work in those industries. And for that matter, I think it's really important that we talk to each other and that we understand better where we're coming from and what our respective needs are so that we can keep this equation functioning, that people can actually use this technology and also be commercially sustainable developing it. And the talks that we had from a very early stage with the automotive industry led us to, to together with other companies, set up Avanci in a direct response to many, many, many requirements that the automotive industry put forward. And I think it's telling that there was a lot of debate around whether that was the right model or not, uh, regardless of the fact that <clears throat> any patent holder part of Avanci obviously also can and need to license bilaterally if, if asked to. There was a lot of debate around the, the model as such, but once Avanci announced that they were going to increase the price, a whole bunch of companies signed straight up. And so it seems to me that maybe it was more of a money issue than a non-functional model. So I, I think even though Amansi took time, I think it's proven to be a way forward in this sense. And similarly, we also joined the recently announced CISFO cellular IoT pool, mm -hmm. who also have announced their, their rates and they are charging $66 for narrowband IoT. And they're charging $2 for smart meters, LTM, and $1.33 for asset trackers. Now, admittedly, that's not all and every patent holder there is, but it's a very important uh, reference point for anyone negotiating with somebody else. So I think, again, these are steps towards helping new industries into this field. There's not one universal means, but there are many steps that could be taken. I think this really does solve the problem, though. I mean, you have the, the question for the, the SME or the problem for the SME, the hypothetical SME, Bo points out, um, is knowing who to approach, having the expertise to work out how to negotiate what the licenses are, and having the bandwidth to negotiate licenses with 15, 20 or 30 players. That's that's very hard for them. If you have uh, these sorts of one-stop shops like Avancy that are available as an alternative, has to be as an alternative, um, then you know that if you don't have the resources to, to go and negotiate better deals with all of the individual patent owners, you can get a license in just one place. Um, mm -hmm. And we see this sort of happens with the music industry as well. There are, there are all sorts of collective licensing arrangements there. Um, and once you get to the size and the volume where you think, you know what, I can get a better deal if I go and negotiate with each of these uh, license, uh, patent owners individually, then by all means go and do so. Um, and having the two systems in parallel um, works very well in, in a way of regulating the price, because if the pool is charging too much, then more and more people will go and take individual licenses and the pool will have to drop its price, otherwise it will simply lose volume. Um, mm -hmm. if, if the uh, patent owners are charging too much, then again, people will prefer and go, go and go straight to the pool. So these, these two systems in competition actually work, work extremely well, both to regulate the price and increase the um, accessibility to everybody. I think the Avancy model is, is successful. I think it's probably the, the way forward for most IoT applications. And the CISFEL, I'm very pleased to hear that the um, CISFEL model of um, a price for an asset tracker, I really could do with some connected asset trackers in my life. <laughs> Let me just echo what Richard said there again. Um, the, the efficiency there is, is for both parties, because obviously it's also a lot of work for a larger player to negotiate with each and every little guy in IoT. So there's a mutual benefit to, to um, that. Yes, and at the moment there's a large degree of unlicensed um, industry um, and you, you pointed out Monica with the with the cars for how many years cars just were not licensed at all. Um, although this may reduce prices what it does do is increase, increase licensing take up and that's then be better for everybody um, because it also means that more of this money is going back into R&D and where the real system failures occur is in, um, in inefficiencies. Um, ideally, every penny, every uh, cent spent in royalties by me when I buy my mobile phone or when I buy my asset tracker or whatever should be going back into R&D. 
the more inefficient system, the more of those pennies get taken out and get put into the pockets of um, patent lawyers like me, um, who, who benefit and profit from the inefficient system. <laughs> and so the more, the more efficient we can make this, the better, because it's ultimately what we want is a completely efficient transfer of money from the, the consumer into the research and development to make the better product, which then makes the consumer the next, the next pro uh, product. Richard, Richard's so busy now, he's, he's arguing for everyone to calm down. Yeah, this, is, this, this is true, actually, there is <laughs> no, but I just, I, just one quick point to this is that um, yeah. this pool, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to discuss the concept of platforms, and I think that uh, Avanci calls itself a platform. And That's for me, right. the reason I would say that it is, is that they, they tried to broker in between, right? So in the beginning, they they talked to the automotive industry, they talked to the SCP holders, because as you as you said, Richard, you want to have both sides, right? If everyone, all the patent owners were all together and all the implementers were together, this would be better for everyone. And Sisfel launched their Wi-Fi 6, again, with this kind of incentive lift model to try to build this platform, two-sided market perspective. And so we can even move beyond pools to platforms. And, and, and I think this would also be uh, very very useful for iot you know it, it's it's a little unsurprising um given the points that you've all been making about the fact that you know monica as you very effectively described you know did you guys are are what economists call repeat players you're you're not going anywhere these are not one-off deals these are you are a network provider so you want people to continue to use your service and you're going to continue to have commercial relationships with the, the companies you're licensing with over long periods of time um and so this uh this creates you know tremendous incentives for people to want to find efficient solutions to potential uh barriers to efficient transactions and licensing when I mean, patent pools have been the go-to, you know, collective uh, market mechanism, as, as Bo described, um, you know, for, for well over 150 years. Um, and the, the it, as you guys have, all three of you, have, I think, have very nicely kind of described in various ways, one of the really interesting things about pen pools is that they're very malleable. They're, you know, they can, they're, they're heterogeneous. They can be structured however the participants would like them to be structured in accordance with the norms of the industry and the nature of the, the business models and the nature of the technology um, and uh, the, uh, and the, and the nature of the value chain, which they are trying to contribute a value, additional value to. Um, so it's uh, quite an, quite, quite interesting uh, to, to observe this kind of evolution of, of rediscovery of pools in the, uh, in the mobile telecommunication space in the past six or seven years. I remember when Avanci started seven years ago and everyone was like, maybe it might work. <laughs> um, but they, they innovated in the way that Bo described, you know, they, you know, they, they developed a platform, they turned a pool into a platform and in doing so made themselves uh, a, 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 a contributor of value to the process. So, um, do, do you, um, uh, Monica, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, do you do you think policymakers can learn anything from the experiences that we've seen in the automotive industry over the past uh, you know, several years here, and the development of the pools and the types of uh, collective market mechanisms that you and Bo and Richard have been talking about? Um anyone can always learn from anything. So I'm sure there's a lot of learnings possible. Um, but I, I think one has to acknowledge that different industries are different. So what worked in automotive may not work in a different industry, may but may not. But, but I think what regulators could do is to, especially towards smaller enterprise, to educate, to make sure that companies know that if they behave according to the Huawei ZD model, even though that's a European case, I think the model actually works across the globe. If, if they do negotiate in good faith, they will not be hit by an injunction, i.e. they will be able to keep using the technology. I think that would be a huge step forward already because then they wouldn't need to worry so much about having the products taken off the market. Um, but also I'm wondering, um, we're talking about rapid deployment. How rapid is rapid? Is is you, you mentioned seven years for Avanci? Is that too long, or is it maybe what the market is doing? I, I think that there are many many uh, questions here that aren't so straightforward as questions actually. Um, 
but I think it's also a lot of communications and guidelines available. There's court cases that regulators could just gather all this information in a, an educational way for small enterprise. I think that is perhaps more effective than trying to regulate such a complex area because already on the legal side, you've got three legal systems. You, you've got patent law, you've got competition law, and you've got contract law. And that already is complexity. And then if you apply that to technology, which is incredibly complicated and develops incredibly fast, regulation is, is challenging to say the least. Because either you'll be too early before the market's developed and you don't really know what it is that you're regulating, or you'll be too late and you might be looking at regulatory measures that will clash with industry initiatives actually going on on the road to being successful maybe next year. So I, I would say um, be a little careful and again, remember to look at both sides of the equation. Because if we do want standards development to go on, it has to be commercially interesting to actually make those major investments up front. And unless somebody does that, there's nothing to discuss on this front at all. Yeah, Monica, it's very interesting. You mentioned kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, regulatory humility on the part of officials who may not fully understand what's happening in kind of the dynamic efficiencies of, of these new technology markets. Um, and, you know, and Bo, to come back to you for a moment, you know, one of the interesting differences between kind of with the, the, you know, the, the mobile smartphone wars that we talked about and that Richard talked about a little earlier as well, um, and the automotive industry and the deployment of, 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 you know, of, of uh, you know, the mobile technologies into the, the automotive industry is that in the context of, of the you know, competition law or antitrust, as we call it in the United States, uh, you know, uh, enforcement, um, they've generally stayed out of the dispute so far in the automotive industry. Um, they did engage very early on in the, uh, the antitrust enforcers, especially in the United States, very early on in the smartphone wars and, um, and in, the mobile, in the mobile telecommunications sector. Um, you know, and, um, and so, um, you know, so despite, you know, so what's happening here, you know, is it, is it because the antitrust enforcers didn't, you know, uh, you know, proactively, you know, in, you know, step into industry licensing and, and, and litigation practices that this is something that incentivized players to f figure out a solution on their own or it, or is there something else going on here? I, I think there's an element of that. Yes. I mean, the European Commission was heavily involved in the Nokia Daimler dispute. Um, there were points when we were having to go over and see them pretty regularly and uh, faced with a, a table of people staring at us in Brussels and arguing about what we were doing. Um, where I think where I think they did it right, I, I should say, to start, I'm a patent lawyer, so my natural enemy is the competition lawyer. Um, and DG Comp is, is staffed by competition lawyers. So I was definitely walking into enemy territory and trying to explain why, why patents were a good thing to a room full of people who, to them, any form of monopoly was inherently evil. So uh, we, we were starting from a pretty low base. But where the European, what the European Commission did right was that they did not put too heavy a thumb on the scale. Um, you could see at the beginning that they had a very clear view and their very clear view was that patents were bad and that this very strong German automotive industry um, needed some form of protection from, um, from, from th this new threat that it faced. But to their credit, they didn't jump in with both feet heavily at the start. They waited, they listened, they listened to both sides, they listened to both sides really extensively. Um, and what they did um, was that they eventually persuaded both sides to enter into a mediation. Now, I don't think the mediation necessarily got anywhere, but what it did do was got people talking um, and it got people to listen um, and engage. Um, and there was a, a very skilled mediator, a gentleman called Christopher Newmark, um, who shuttled back between the respective parties and looked for common ground and listened to our arguments and played back what, what, what was coming on the other side. Um, and he did, he did to his credit a good job. The mediation didn't settle anything. Um, what it eventually settled was the, the Avancy pool solved the problem. But what it enabled was discussion and talking um, and people to see the other side and people to see that a solution was going to have to be achieved through talking rather than 
uh, a regulator coming in with heavy boots and fines or statements of objections or huge requests for information or the sorts of weapons that they have in their arsenal. Um, and you're right, it contrasts rather heavily with the DOJ's behavior in the United States uh, against Qualcomm, where you know it, it did jump in with both boots. Um, and I, I think that although uh, the competition lawyer may be my natural enemy, in this case, the, the, the commission did uh, adopt a, a suitably light touch. Um, and that's probably the way that regulation should work. I, I can add to that uh, a bit, Adam. Uh, you know, regulators want to regulate, right? <laughs> Surgeons want to operate. You know, this is what we do. And, uh, and so they, they were constrained, I think. They constrain themselves. And, and I think it's positive. And the reason that I think that I'm a little concerned about the use of antitrust is that it's already been embedded in it from the beginning, right? That just the creation of a standard development organization has been has been under antitrust scrutiny. Uh, the Fran Agreement and how that's done is that in general, people have thought about from this perspective as well. When you create pools, you have also antitrust scrutiny about how that's done. So it's a little strange with all this, again, going back, all this collective activity that you start to use the antitrust authority in a very kind of, how do you say, traditional way, as if it's just arm's length agreements between market actors, when we've already kind of agreed to do all this in a very collective way um, on many, many layers. So, so while there, there is places for antitrust competition policy, um, I think that the way that it's deployed to kind of set the boundaries and um, safe harbors is pretty good because of the collective nature and, and because there is a contract. Now, now, we'll see whether this stays in the recording or not, depending on how Richard tells me if I'm correct or not. But when you when you work with, with SCPs in Germany, it is done under uh, antitrust, not a contract perspective, if I'm correct. And if I am correct, this will stay in. Otherwise, no one else will ever hear this. But uh, and, be, and so there is this discussion in this perspective that's already built in as well in the German in the German way. But in the United States, we treat it more like contracts. I know the Ninth Circuit says, hey, patents and contracts. Can't we just, that, that's what we all agreed upon. Let's do it that way. Um, but it does come back again to what Richard said and it goes all the way back to what we decided in the beginning. Monica had this example with her car for, for a number of years that wasn't licensed. And Richard went through the discussion on people talking to each other and learning. And so for me, antitrust is, a, is like a negotiation strategy in, in the game of licensing. It's not a solution for building standards enabled markets. What has to happen is there has to be an early understanding and discussion in the value chain of these different IoT verticals. Um, you know, once indemnifications are wrongly given and products are shipped, you start to go, you start to have created something that's difficult to unwind. So the earlier that people can talk, the earlier that this can be handled and understood amongst the actors, the better. And there, the commission and other uh, and other policymakers have a very very important role. To facilitate that, the other success we should remember is that the uh, is that the huge policy success of getting Etsy set up in the first place of that 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 collaboration back in the nineteen eighties to nineteen nineties um, and what it has led to uh, has has been remarkable. I think Monica said that there is no other technology that's anything like as complex or as popular. And I remember when I first joined the industry, being astonished to find that people had mobile phones who didn't have clean water or toilets. It's, that is how pervasive and how successful this technology has been. Um, and so somebody back then, there was, there was a serious policy success in creating and setting up and allowing this, this collaboration. I, I'd like to say it was primarily with, within Europe. Of course, there were big US actors in there as well. And now the bringing in of the big Asian uh, and Chinese players as well into this, this system is, is remarkable. So it's, it's easy to bash the policymakers and tell them they're being too heavy handed, but sometimes they, they have done some really good things to, to get us to where we are. If they do their job right, they facilitate yeah, uh, the, the transactions and, and, and the companies to produce the amazing products that everyone benefits from and makes everyone's lives better off. Grows the innovation economy, close the global innovation economy, increase flourishing societies. Um, this has been an incredibly robust and interesting and fascinating discussion. It's been great to hear the uh, the back and forth between all three of you. Um, maybe we should close out with just maybe one more question. So um, so often one times hears about 
you know, the importance of transparency. There's a very interesting aspect of transparency, I think, that came out of this discussion. Richard very early on mentioned that, you know, and I think that the licensing rate for um, mobile telecommunications for cars is $5 and um, <clears throat> um, or pro approximately in that area, four or five, four or five dollars or four or five euros, maybe. Um, what? Uh, Sorry. The, the, the Avanci rate was 15 and it went up to 20. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> and you said, oh, and we might have lower prices if, you know, these cars go unlicensed, but we're talking like a Mercedes automobile in the United States is like 60,000 US dollars. <laughs> so I can't imagine a buyer of a, of a US automobile saying, well, I was going to pay $80,000 or 60,000 US dollars for this Mercedes, but now that you've tacked on this $15 fee for, <laughs> for it to be connected, I'm not going to buy it now. <laughs> that was... That took me over 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 my price point. <laughs> Um, so, but one often here is the, about the importance of transparency and, 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 and negotiations and discussions and the business structures and things of this sort. Um, so Monica, I think we'll, we'll close it out with you and, and, you know, uh, from someone, uh, working in, on the ground in the industry, producing these new values, um, is transparency, you know, important? Is this the way to go for, you know, IOT licensing going forward? Again, a very broad term, transparency. <laughs> <laughs> it's who can be against transparency? <laughs> no, exactly. Like world peace, or <laughs> yes. whatever. Uh, no, but I, I um, again, what is it that we're talking about? I think in in the transparency context, just like any of these topics, I think it's important that we identify concrete problems and set clear goals to solve them. If if we identify clear problems. And in that sense, I think industry and regulators can work together. Um, like I said already, there are there is already a lot of transparency. There's a lot of court cases, a lot of rates that have been determined to be friend or not to be friend, a lot of behavior that has been determined to be or not to be friend compliant. Um, and there's a lot to look at. And also I, I would stress that we will never have complete transparency. And I don't think anybody wants that either because that would expose everybody's, any, every business secret. Um, the commitment here is to license patents. And patent licensing, contrary to patent litigation, does not resolve all the uncertainty. That's the whole point of patent licensing, that you find a business a, a solution that makes business sense to both parties where you agree on a contract to get you out of all the hard and very expensive work of resolving every uncertainty. That's the point of patent licensing. So I, I think it's important for industry and regulators to work together and to, to uh, make what information is already out there available to small enterprise and above all make sure that investing in developing standards remained commercially interesting because again otherwise we don't have anything to talk about in these interesting seminars <laughs> and and to certain and to kind of bookend from Bo's opening remarks too you know that the, it, one of the one of the incredible virtues of standard development organizations as they developed in you know especially in in the west is that they are open and transparent and it's a collective process that everyone can participate in um and it it produces the incredible results in in part as a result so it's probably the greatest feat of human collaboration that the world has ever seen well I don't think we can go off out on a better note than than I think that statement. Um, so uh, with that, um, incredible thank yous to uh, Monica and Bo and Richard for really a, just a fantastic, engaging and interesting discussion about uh, the evolution of patent licensing and in, in, in uh, uh, the mobile telecommunications market specifically, the innovation economy more generally, and, and as we're going forward into automobiles and the inter internet of things in the future. So uh, thank you all. I hope our audience enjoyed this. Uh, please visit the Forum for Intellectual Property website uh, for more information on these topics and many others at, at the Hudson Institute's website and, uh, and at their respective centers and organizations and, um, and other activities. So thank you. Thank you.